when they call my name, my heart just pounds completely. It feels like it's jumping out of my chest. I'm very nervous, I've got butterflies. And just stare down the line and just know that that's where I want to be first. When you think about heart transplant, you think, oh, someone's really ill, um, has a new heart, but isn't able to do anything, but you're able to do absolutely anything. It's just normal, really. The demands of high-intensity anaerobic sport can be physiologically challenging for even the fittest athletes in the world, let alone an athlete who's overcome life-threatening illnesses. At the age of 12, Emma Hilton underwent a heart transplant. Age 21, she survived stage 4 lymphoma cancer. But the now 27-year-old Briton doesn't like to dwell on the days she spent with heart monitors and Hickman lines. Instead, she now has her eyes set on speedometers and finish lines. I don't feel bitter about any of it because it's made me who I am now. And it's given, it, especially with, through the transplant, like it's given me a new lease of life. Apart from that, I was told to just try and stay fit and active and continue life. I've always enjoyed athletics. I mean, watching it on TV, the Olympics and everything like that, it's just amazing. And I think just being able to, to do it, you know, like putting your, pushing your body to that sort of limit. And I think just with the running group I am, they're so encouraging and they've just, I don't know, it's such a, a lovely place to be. So just keep at it, I haven't stopped and I don't think I will ever stop. Medical history is made at this hospital where the world's first heart transplant patients Louis this December marks the 50th anniversary of the first ever heart transplant, carried out by Dr. Christian Barnard in South Africa. Since then, over 100,000 people worldwide have undergone heart transplantation. Surgeons can now transplant non-beating hearts, and there are fewer rejections than ever before. I think it's amazing. I think the fact that 50 years on and there's so many people who have been transplanted and um, I think the fact that everyone is able to do so much more than probably what we thought we were able to do about 50 years ago, I think it just shows that transplantation is um, a new way of prolonging life. And at the moment, I think the heart transplant survival rate is up to 33 years. So from when I was transplanted, it was like five years. Emma received her heart transplant when she was just a child. Growing up, she was always very active. However, age 12, her mother noticed that her pulse was racing, so took her to the hospital. They discovered that she had dilated cardiomyopathy. I don't remember any of this, but I, I walked into hospital um, and they put a line in my arm and used different ways of trying to slow my heart down, but nothing worked. And I think in the end, they had to shock my heart. After they shocked the heart, the consultant um, came to us and he said, it's not looking very good. We said, what on earth are you talking about? And he said, um, you know, there's a quite a high chance that she could die. And then I was put on for life, life support for nine days um, and then hoping my heart would recover and it didn't. So I was put on the transplant list that day, told my parents to go out for a walk and 45 minutes later they'd found my heart. So I was very lucky. Almost 300 people in the UK currently await a heart transplant. Emma was fortunate in that she was able to be taken straight to the operating theatre. It's very, very hard to put into words now. Um, having gone through that, it was like walking through a fog. Um, we didn't know what was happening. It was just a really, really difficult time for us, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it was, it was overload. Yeah, we were. I and mean, obviously, we, first of all, we were hoping that she'd survive the operation because she was very, very ill. I mean, she was so ill. I think. I, I think she was as close to death as she could have been. But because after she had the operation, she didn't recover very quickly. Um, she was still two months in high dependency because she, yeah, she didn't really wake up for quite some time after the operation. So we didn't really know how well she'd be. And then eventually, after a number of weeks, she finally did. I can remember it. I can remember the time she started to wake up. I literally don't remember anything up until um, probably when I was taken off some of the drugs and I started having um, hallucinations. For a child to have a transplant, to save your child's life, you save a family, there's no doubt. And um, because the thought of, you know, losing Emma, we just, no, I just I don't know how we would have coped. On the advice of her doctor, 
Emma gradually got back into sport to keep her heart healthy. She won a gold medal in swimming at the British Transplant Games before taking up athletics. Her passion for sport led her to study sports science at university. However, in the final year of her study, she found herself back in hospital after receiving some more devastating medical news from her doctor. And he was like, yeah, I think you might have suspected lymphoma. And I knew, kind of knew what it was, but he kind of just like, okay, yeah. Um, and then I looked on the sheet and it said, like, suspected cancer, and I just... You know when they look at you and they're just like, are you okay? And you're like, yeah, I'm fine. And then you start to break down. Um, so I came home and obviously started bawling my eyes out, telling my parents. Well, here we go again. I don't know, I was, was just so devastated for her. Emma immediately started a six-month cycle of chemotherapy. So I knew I was going to lose my hair. I knew it was going to be that way. Emma, I think I had, I did have a couple of mental breakdowns in a sense. I remember one time I got to the point where I was vomiting so much and all I wanted to do was sleep in my own bed. You know, she had a really, really rough time. And, uh, you know, so she was in hospital most of the time because she was quite ill. She was, she didn't come home a lot. And as soon as she came home, she was hospitalised again. So as soon as I come out of hospital, I'd go to the track. If I couldn't run there, I'd just go and see everyone. So I was kind of, I was always wanting to get back into fitness. So I would like, I'd have my Hickman line still in and I'd go out and do a bit of like circuit, stuff like that. Anything I could do, I would do it. Since her recovery from cancer, Emma has gone on to compete at the World Transplant Games, in which she's won 24 medals. In 2015, she was the championship's Usain Bolt, clinching gold in the 100, 200 and the 4 by 100 metres. When I crossed that line and I knew I'd won my medal, it was just over the moon. It was just amazing. I think like the fact that I'd pushed my body to the limits at training and I knew what I wanted to achieve and pushing myself that a little bit harder and managing to get those medals, yeah, I was very happy. Well done, Emma. Given all of the adversity she's faced in her life, Emma's positive attitude has been an inspiration for others, particularly those undergoing transplantation or those considering becoming an organ donor. In most countries, the number of people that require a transplant far outweighs the number of donors. Three people die every day in the UK alone awaiting an organ. Like most nations, the UK currently employs an opt-in rather than opt-out policy to organ donation. And I think if you're willing to take an organ, I think you should be willing to donate if possible, if you're able to and you're not medically unable to. But I think it's important to show like, that life can go on after people pass away and I hope that we, we show that we can do our donors proud. It's credit to, credit to her and she's a credit to her donor. You know, I mean, if the donor family could, could see her now, I, I think they may just appreciate you know, the, the chance of life they gave her 